Hey everybody, this is Rashmi, your host for the day, and I would like to welcome you for this panel discussion where we are going to discuss about how to restart business operation and drive growth in the new normal. Today's event is brought to you by Design Hill, which is the world's leading creative marketplace that caters to the creative need of businesses and individuals alike who can source high quality designs from professional designers and buy unique products created by independent artists. I would like to thank our guest speakers for today uh, who have taken out their time to, um, to be present here. Let me introduce uh, our panelists for today. Uh, we have Barry Maltz with us. He's a speaker, uh, business, small business expert and an author. He helps businesses in the areas of sales, marketing, social media, customer service, finance and people management. Uh, Barry, would you like to say a quick hi to the audience? Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Uh, next we have is Ivana Tyler. Ivana is the publisher of DIYMarketers.com, a resource for entrepreneurs who want to do less marketing and make more money. In 2010, she ranked number one uh, of 30,000 influential people on the internet. She's the book editor for Small Business Trends, a contributing author to Amex Open Forum and has appeared on MSNBC. Ivana. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Next we have is Laurie McCap. Laurie brings over 25 years of IT industry experience to her current role as a co-founder and partner at SMB Group. Laurie has earned widespread recognition for her insights into small and medium business technology adoption, requirement and challenges. Laurie. Hey everyone, nice to see you all today. Next we have is Riva. Uh, she is a small business and entrepreneurship thought leader, advocate and journalist. Her mission is to help people start and grow their own businesses, which she has been doing for over 30 years now. She's also a best-selling author and has written several books about small business and entrepreneurship. Hi, it's great to be here. So uh, guys, uh, Steve, was not able, Steve is not able to join us today because uh, he is having some internet challenges uh, from his end. Uh, nonetheless, we have all the four uh, other panelists with us. So thank you so much once again, guys, for taking out your time and joining us for this panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks. So right. before we start, before we start, let's quickly look at what Design Hill is all about. CarMax is a full-service video agency based around video production. We created a brand that fit our identity at the time, but as we've evolved as a company, we found that that original brand didn't quite fit our aspirations anymore. Finding a partner to rebrand your entire company takes a lot of time and effort. Finding Design Hill was an incredible lifeline. Design Hill offers a money-back guarantee. If we don't like any of the designs, we get all of our money back. The stuff that we ended up with were well beyond what we had been seeing on other creative services platforms. After creating a simple design brief by answering some questions created by Design Hill, we posted and within a few days, we had over 250 entries. Design Hill's platform made it easy to communicate with all the potential designers. Eventually, we picked a winner. In addition to a logo, our designer also created a letterhead, business cards, and banners for all of our social media platforms. With Design Hill's help, we now have a brand that meets our aspirations. We're ready for the future and everything that it's here to bring. Okay. All right. So let's let's start this panel discussion. Laurie, uh, let me start with you, and uh, then I'll take it to the to the other panelist. Uh, now that businesses are reopening post lockdown, what steps should brands take to restart their business operation, and how uh, can they jumpstart sales again? Well, I mean, that's obviously a, a complicated question, and there is no one size fits all. Obviously, a retailer is different from a professional services, is different than manufacturing, et cetera. But there are a couple of big trends that we see really uh, framing up where all businesses need to be thinking about and going. So the first one is obviously work from home. The genie's out of the bottle. And companies really have to learn how to create a flexible and secure work from home environment in which people can be truly productive. 
Um, I think we, you know, all of us rushed to to get that going, but now you have to really try to fine tune it and make it really strong. The second thing um, that we don't think is going to go away at all is this whole trend towards the virtual. So whether it's telemedicine or online learning or, or you know, yeah. sessions like this, yes, we'll come back to physical meetings, but most businesses are really going to have to learn how to accommodate doing a lot more of what they do in a virtual way. And then the third thing is touch-free or touchless or no-touch transactions. No one wants to touch anything now, right? So if you are, you know, in any kind of business, you know, whether like it's a restaurant, think about how, you know, there's a lot of solutions. You don't have to provide, let's say, physical menus anymore. Or, uh, you know, if you're using kiosks or something, you, you're going to have to find a way for people to use their mobile phone maybe to check in and, and do things that they might have done with on something that everybody was touching. So that is, is definitely the, the third strong one. And then the last one is the cloud. We've definitely found that um, small and medium businesses have gotten a ton of value from being able to use cloud applications is just a whole lot easier. You don't have to mess around with VPNs and all that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, thinking about what applications you have that are not in the cloud and, and maybe moving them there would be the fourth thing. Betty, would you like to add to that? Oh, you know, I'd always like to add to that. <laughs> I think building on what Lori said, I think the biggest question that small business owners need to ask themselves now is to picture a world where people rarely leave their homes or when they do leave their homes, the biggest thing that's on their mind is really safety. So you have to pivot, you have to reimagine your business to really answer that question. What does your company look like when people rarely leave their homes or they're afraid of, of their own safety? And the best way to start is really to ask them that question and then to reimagine what your company might look like by taking stock of the complete inventory of what you really bring to the table. So what are the skills? What are the assets? What partners do you have that really can you can use in the market to, to really use and adapt to what customers really need today? I really believe that we can't put our heads in the sand and wait for this to be over. Now is really a time to burn the boats and realize that the world that was in January and February of this year really has forever changed. So just like cockroaches, we have to really adapt or, or, or really we're going we're gonna to die as small business owners. Great. Uh, so, Himana, I have. I would like to ask you this question. Uh, you know, can you throw some light on? You know, how did this demand disruption uh, during this pandemic impacted businesses around the world, and you know, how how can they recover from from its aftermath? Now that you know businesses are, have started opening up, how can they uh, start their recovery process, and what steps should they take to uh, to to recover from it? Well, I'm going to start with some basics. Okay, one of the things that uh, small business owners, especially Main Street business owners, business owners that have a brick and mortar location, one of the things that they have notoriously ignored is the Google My Business section. Uh, you have to remember that, especially now, I, I, I've just done this recently, looked up businesses on my phone to see what their hours were and what they were doing, and none of that had been updated. So this is something that takes about five minutes to do. Instead of doing it once a year or once every three to five years, you're going to need to do this weekly because things are changing weekly. Be sure to tell people what's happening because if you don't have that information updated, they may, make, they may not call, they may not come, right? This is also actually, you know, we're talking about getting customers and rebooting and that's so important. But one of the biggest mistakes I see small business owners make is they get freaked out and they jump into action. This is a really good time to take a step back and identify some of these things, like where are your customers from? Who are your customers? All the things that Barry and Lori talked about. This is a really good time to take a new look at your online presence and see what the connection is between your online presence and your offline presence. So you may need to update. Maybe you need to update your um, 
your designs, your logos, your materials, because people are engaging with your business differently. And you're going to have to set up some structures because you, you've got new habits. And with new habits, they're kind of hard to repeat. And that's where a lot of success comes from. And you know what? From a marketing perspective, when you have a structure in place that you can share with your customers on your website, on your Google, on your materials, it gives them peace of mind. So that, that you know, that not only makes, uh, makes you prepare and make sure you have everything ready, it helps your customers feel comfortable with you. Great. Riva, what do you have to say about that? Um, well, I agree with everything that everyone has said. And I, I, I <laughs> but I think Barry made a point that um, a lot of people are overlooking. People keep thinking, oh, when this is over, and we don't know when this is over. I live in California. We're, we're on semi lockdown again. Um, and we're probably going to be, uh, you know, safe and stay at home, safer at home policies um, are probably going to be imposed because right now in our state, and we're the biggest state, things are a little out of control. So I think if you have not, if you have been operating on, here's what I'm going to do for the next couple of weeks to, to get through this, it's time to think of like, where's your pivot? What are you going to do if this lasts for nine months or two years or or what you need to come up with your plan b of what to do if you it's like even i said if you have um it's time to look at your online so let's say you're a retailer well you're going to have limited people coming in your store and i saw today that the national retail federation has called for um a national mask policy for all retail stores they just want all retailers covered so um I, so you have to think about how you're going to fit in with that because you have to make your customers comfortable. But it's not just online selling. It's what other outlets. How else can you sell? Can you sell online? Can you sell through so your social channels? Can you sell through Amazon or Walmart or Etsy or one of the online marketplaces? And so you need to come up with your contingency plans. And you have to do that fast. You don't have the luxury of time right now. Great. Uh, Betty, I would like to ask you this question. Uh, you know, small businesses have faced a lot of financial constraint because of this pandemic, right? Uh, can you share some tips for uh, sustainable financing and what is the best way to obtain funding for those who are starting a new business at times like these? Well, I think today it's really difficult to get funding from anybody except the, if you're in the United States, except the U.S. government. I, again, it varies by different countries in the world, but now is really the time when you have to really forget about growth, forget about your sales, even profit is not that important. But the thing that you need to look at right now is really your cash flow for a couple of reasons, because every single business during a recession goes out of business for exactly the same reason, and that's because they run out of cash. So you have to make sure that you know how to read the cash flow statement so you know how much money you actually have from month to month. And hopefully you can apply to your government for, uh, for resources in order to make up for some of, some of the losses that you have, and then make sure that you do have enough money to ensure that you have enough cash flow to get through this time, which I believe is for a lot of countries is gonna go on for at least another nine or 12 months. But knowing where you are from a cash flow standpoint is pretty critical. Make sure that you jealously guard your cash because if you run out of cash, then you're gonna be out of business. Laurie, what do you have to say about that? Well, cash is definitely king and, and cash yeah, muted. This, Let me unmute you. Uh, yeah. Wait. Yes. Got it. <laughs> yeah, cash is definitely king. And people, you know, running businesses, a lot of them have kind of gotten, I don't know, deer in the headlights because they're afraid or they will run out of cash. And I, I think there's a few things to think of here. First of all, a lot of even basic accounting solutions like Xero or um, Intuit QuickBooks, things like that, have 
tools in them to help you manage cash flow better. And a lot of businesses just don't really use them. Um, second of all, there's some tactical things that you can do for cash flow. You can offer customers discounts if they pay, let, let's say, net 15 days instead of you know net 30 or net 60 or something like that. So take a little many maybe off the top, but you know get the cash in more quickly. You can look at any assets in your business that you don't use. Um, and, and I think right now, a lot of businesses can look and say, you know, I may never use some of this stuff again um, and, and try to sell some of that. And then the third thing I think is just looking at what you do sell and, you know, like every business is different, but think about how you can maybe reposition and also restructure some of those offerings in terms of packaging and pricing. You know, talk to your customers. Find out what is it that's changing about what you need, why you buy, how you buy. It doesn't have to be, you know, some Gallup survey. You can do it if you're really small one-on-one, -on -one, or you can use like a survey tool in MailChimp. But test some things and, and see how you can rejigger so that you can maybe start jump-starting stuff a little more quickly. Wonderful. Uh, Ivana, I would like to ask you this question. Uh, you know, now that, now that businesses are coming out of lockdown and um, it is more than important now to reconnect with your customers and suppliers. So what are the ways for businesses to reconnect with your customers, suppliers, employees through digital channels and how to establish, you know, again, the, the same old relationship with them and uh, probably a better one? How to go about that? Well, <clears throat> I'm just going to go through a series of tips first. You know, things that maybe used to live in the background for you, such as like a, you know, like your Facebook page or different Facebook communities have popped up. Like in my town, we have now a Facebook community uh, about what is it, restaurant carryout or something like that. So this is where restaurants are keeping folks up to date and answering questions. So take a look at local Facebook communities, your Facebook page and re-engage with them. That's on the social media side. Another thing you can be doing is really start using your customer email list. Some of the best things I've seen is some of our local businesses are emailing their customers and telling them some of the things that they have open. Maybe they're offering discounts, but email is the perfect way to give people relevant information. And again, if you're, uh, let's say, a, a professional services, like a lawyer, dentist, chiropractor, that type of thing, um, you can use text. You can text message your customers. I just uh, had an appointment the other day, and the rule was that you had to text, you know, text them when you're in the parking lot. They'll come and get you and let you in. You know, so there's lots of different ways that you can keep in touch with your customers that way. Uh, think about um, making a collection of commonly asked questions and answering them and making sure that that is uh, posted somewhere and share that with your customers. Um, other things you can be doing is take your customers backstage with you. Use your social media channels to share what's going on on the back end. You know, you can post and, you know, if, if your employees are going through a wipe down process, cleaning things up, that's the kind of thing you want to share. Um, so really, I see a lot of small business owners, um, they're so focused on selling and serving customers that they don't, that these communications have sort of gone off on the back burner. And now is the time to uh, bring some of that back. Amazing. That's some powerful tips that uh, you have shared. Uh, Reva, would you like to add to that? You're muted. Um, I, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, it depends again on what kind of business you have and where you're located. So one of the things I saw, if you're a retailer, and one of the, the best tips I, I've, I've heard, if you're a retailer in a, not in a mall, and actually um, sort of more like where you, you can walk out your door and there's a sidewalk, 
uh, set up a table out there with some of your most popular items and put an employee out there with a tablet that they can, um, so people don't have to go in a store. So they can stand outside, check and see what you've got um, and say, hey, this, maybe this come in a medium and your employee can check on the tablet on inventory and, and do the sale right there on the spot. So nobody has to walk in a store if they are not comfortable doing so. Your job right now as a business owner is to make your customers comfortable. This is what, I, and your employees comfortable. I mean, I don't think we can overlook that. This is really important. It's it's not about right now, it's not about having necessarily the best prices or the best merchandise or the best whatever. No one is gonna come to your office, your store, your restaurant, if they are not comfortable, if they don't feel comfortable being there. And unfortunately, we are so, polarized in this country over i'm going to be really honest over really stupid things like wearing a mask should not be debatable and if you want to send me hate tweets feel free wearing a mask is not it should not be a debatable issue and like i said the nrf the national retail foundation is saying we need a, a an all-in mask policy in terms of going into retail stores so when you think about customers and and wanting to make sure they feel comfortable in your environment you need to make sure it's sort of what even has said about sharing your training processes sharing what you're doing to make sure that you are offering a clean and healthy environment for people to come shop or do business in. Okay, Betty, I I really like your quick action of wearing a mask <laughs> right after we got talked about. Wear a mask. It's a new, it's a new fashion accessory. I have that like thirty of these. It's great. <laughs> and yes, as Riva rightly mentioned, it should not be debatable, right? It should not be. And okay. the plus is, you can you don't have to wear lipstick. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> amazing now is the new shift for all the makeup companies is to focus on eye makeup right yeah. and that makes yeah. sense right yeah. so well, that's a yeah. perfect example of really a kind of recalibrating for customer experience and what customers want right um more eye makeup less lip gloss <laughs> exactly. Exactly. and huge opportunity for textile industry to uh, come up with fancy uh, masks yeah, I, I mean, I think every apparel maker I I get marketed to is selling masks. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, a perfect example of kind of pivoting really quick to to supply something that we all need and want. And you know, if you're a, a fan of Athleta or you're a fan of Gap or whatever you're a fan of, you can you know buy the masks that appeal to you. Yeah, great. So now that we are on the topic of supply, I have uh, the next question I have for uh, for Barry is related to that only. So Barry, uh, because of this whole COVID outbreak thing, businesses have faced you know staff shortages, uh, restriction in delivery routes, and other supply chain related challenges, right? So how should businesses overcome these risks and build resilient supply chains for themselves? Well, I think you got to. I think you have to know what is your supply chain. What does it look like? If you have vendors that you're dependent on, how are they doing? Reach out to them. One of the biggest things now is people are so isolated because of all the shutdowns all over the world. They're really going to appreciate if you give them a call, or better yet, do some kind of video thing to say, "Hey, how are you doing? How are you faring?" Because most people are struggling. You know, form that bond and figure out where your dependencies are. If there's one part of your supply chain that's really weak, you gotta look for an alternate to make sure that you can deliver for your customer. So I think at this point, understanding what the deficiencies in your supply chains are, you gotta think about it. I mean, who would have ever thought that Amazon couldn't deliver what you wanted in two days? That was unheard of. That's the supply chain problems that we're having all over the world. Wonderful. Uh, Ivana, would you like to add to that? Well, 
I'm not really a supply chain expert, but one of the things you do want to keep in mind, I'm going to hearken back to your customers. One of the things I posted in the chat a little bit ago is now is a great time to double down on your values. Always understand that customers, um, yes, they want their products, but they're also savvy consumers. So choose your supply chain wisely. Actually, I think Reva is the woman to answer this question. You've done a lot of work on supply chain. I'll take it to Reva then. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ethan. I have actually. So the one key now about supply chain is make sure your supply chain is diversified. Before all this happened, I think a lot of businesses found that they they concentrated their supply chain in a either with a few companies or in a certain country. And all of a sudden, friends of mine actually, small manufacturers, did all their manufacturing in China. And in January, they have a very seasonal seasonal sales product, sunglasses. Um, so they had early ordered early in China in January because of the Chinese New Year. But then when it was pretty obvious that they weren't going to be able to get stuff after that New Year's period ended, they were scrambling because that was the only place that they had as a supply chain. And they found some local places here in, in the U.S. so they could get stuff quickly. So if if you have not yet, make right now is the perfect time to expand your supply chain. Figure out where and, and have several places. Don't don't put all your your eggs in one basket. Where can you get stuff from all over the world? Not just make sure you have a local source here in the US, but also look all over the world for for places. Um Alibaba just launched um something where it's easier they're they're hoping to be connecting people with um suppliers in china but also in um other other southeast asian countries but now they're doing it where they're listing u.s uh supply suppliers as well so go on a resource like that to see where you can build your supply chain so it's diversified and you're not ever stuck again yeah, and I, I just like to add something. I, I totally agree with that. And when we saw a lot of in our surveys, SMBs, um, you know, that are, are, are in a physical product business doing that. The problem is in some industries and bicycles are a great example of this, but it's not just bicycles. You can't get a bike anymore unless you want to spend at least a few thousand dollars. 86% of all bikes are made in China. And it's not just the fact that more people want to get out and ride bikes, but all the new kind of trade restrictions in China are coming in. And bike shops are very strapped. I mean, the same thing is going on with a lot of products, kayaks, um, things you put on your gutter. You wouldn't believe all the things that they're just so heavily made in China and and heavily in demand and, and suppliers cannot get these things. I mean, retailers cannot get these things. So I would flip the whole thing too and really encourage US manufacturers to take a look at some of these opportunities. And I know it's not trivial to retool manufacturing, but there are gonna be some good long-term areas to start um, you know, actually manufacturing it again in this country. And I think there's a real opportunity there. And and doing a little research, it may be that you're in a tangential industry and the retooling for you would not be, you know, so far out. And you might be able to do it and really take advantage of the situation. Lori, I don't know if you've seen this thing where they're, they're, it's all over Facebook where there's like this little widget you're supposed to make sure that you don't uh, touch a door. It's a metal object, or you can hook on a door to open it up. And that's all people are doing is just retooling uh, something they already have to make a different little, little metal thing. So it's yeah. fantastic. Exactly. And I mean, I know like making a bike or a kayak is more complicated, <laughs> but I, I do think that we're going to, for a lot of reasons, not just COVID, we're going to want to have more manufacturing come back to the U.S. And it is an opportunity for manufacturers. I mean, think about all those auxiliaries that are now using their raw alcohol to make hand sanitizers. And I believe in a few years, there won't be any right. risky at all in the U.S. Oh, that's sad. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that, right. will never that will never happen. <laughs> All right, everyone. All right. I hope you guys are enjoying this wonderful discussion. Before we move forward, I would quickly like to give a shout out to Design Hill, which is the world's leading creative marketplace for organizing this panel discussion. Let's quickly take a two minutes break and keep this interesting conversation going. Um, Stay tuned. We will be back to hear more from Barry, Ivana, Laurie, and Riva. I've always been creative and always been an artist. As a young girl, I used to paint rocks and I used to sell them for a quarter on the street. <laughs> and I just fell in love with it. It just grew into a passion of mine. I started looking on the web and I came across Design Hill and they had a design contest to design a logo and I entered it and, and I won. And I was like, oh, this is really great. I can pick and choose what type of logos or design projects I want to work on. And it allows me to be creative, keep my hands, you know, with my tools and, and working. So it's kind of nice. It's really easy to use. You can scroll through the projects and there's sections that you could go by. It's really easy. There's a few clients who have come back to use the one-on-one -on -one projects. There's one client in particular, she owns a vintage shop and I designed her logo and she came back. She needed a design for a flyer and she really liked the illustrations that I did for her. So she came back a couple of times with projects. I would recommend it, especially um, if you're a designer that's starting out and you want to learn from other designers, seasoned designers. It's a place to keep in the game and keep using your tools. It makes me feel great and it kind of confirms that I should be doing this. And I love to see logos that I've designed out and proud of that. And I think that the clients are so happy that their logo represents what they do and you know makes them look good. It's a collaboration, it's good for me and it's definitely good for them. Looking to get your boss to remember your name? Head to the world's number one creative marketplace, Design Hill. When my company promoted me to head up our latest real estate development project, I was excited, then anxious, then petrified. How was I going to hire the team, get the designs completed, and design beautiful presentation materials on our lean budget while impressing my bosses, some of whom are still learning my name? Good job, Mitch. My name's Lawrence. That's why I went to Design Hill and got the design help I needed that fit within my company's brand guidelines. The process was simple. Design Hill's design contest ensured I'd get a ton of results I'd love. Start by picking a number of designs that inspire you. This one's good, and that one. This one speaks to me. Then share some information about the project. Lastly, pick a package that fits your budget. Do you just want a logo, or do you want it all? Then, boom. I got more than 60 custom design options to choose from, as well as all the other graphic design assets I wanted. And it's all backed by Design Hill's 100% money back guarantee. If I don't find a design I like, I get my money back. You can't lose. Now I have what I need to make a splash of my meetings. With everything from business cards, pamphlets, posters, and more. It's real. Let the world know it's real and build your brand with Design Hill. All right, guys, we are back. Let's continue with the amazing discussion. And as I said, do not forget to put your questions in the question section. We'll definitely take it up at the uh, end. Um, so uh, let's continue with the discussion. Uh, Ivana, this question is for you. In a situation like this where, uh, you know, safety is the utmost concern for each and everyone, what steps companies should take to ensure the well-being and safety of their employees as well as their customers? Well, the number one answer to that is you have to satisfy three people, three uh, constituencies, right? First is your customers because they pay the bills. Second, of course, is your employees because they do the work. And the third is, of course, you have to do it yourself. So one of the things you have to do is you have to put structures in place. You have to make sure you do your research and understand what it is that's required of you. And then the second thing you might want to do is understand also where are your customers in that? 
you know, I'm in a region of the country where I would say our mask wearing right now is at like 50 50. And whereas uh, every business employee has to wear a mask, people who come into the business may or may not choose to wear a mask. So you need to make sure that if you are running the kind of business where you absolutely positively want everyone to wear a mask, have a mask available. I put in the chat that they can, uh, you can have a little logo or something designed on Design Hill and make some masks and have them there for your customers. It's a promotional item, right? Um, I, I think I said earlier, you have to have uh, procedures in place, whether you do videos, whether if you have special rules or things that you want from your customers, make sure you communicate that on social media, on email, communicate, communicate, communicate everywhere. If you think you are tired of listening or saying the same thing over and over again, you need to say just like one more time on every channel because it's new to those people who are just seeing that message today. So do sit down hey, and sit down with your team and maybe engage with some customers. Take this as a market research opportunity and get feedback. Say, these are the rules. We are absolutely doing this. What would make you feel comfortable? Now you've got enrollment and involvement. Ariva, would you like to add to that? There we go. Yes, I, I think like, like I said before, it's about um, it's about the low. I think it's about the lowest common denominator. It's about making people feel comfortable um, if they're going out. But I also think that that you have to think about if people aren't going to be going out. How are you going to serve? Um, customers, let's say you you haven't before. How are you going to serve customers online? What is your alternative? What what's your other you know another way for you to make for you to make money? So in our um, every every um, week we do something called the Trendcast. It's free newsletter. You can sign up at um, smallbizdaily.com. And the one I did this week is a, a big research company reported that snacks, snacking was just up tremendously because Americans tend to eat when they're stressed and we're very stressed right now. So salty snacks and frozen food snacks are really skyrocketing. So most people would say, okay, that's big food manufacturers, right? That's the people are going to the grocery store and you know, they're buying cookies and crackers and pretzels and whatever. But if you're a restaurant owner right now and you're thinking, okay, I have fewer people coming into my restaurant, what am I gonna do? Think about that. So you see snacks are up and package, package some some snacks that you can do for delivery because delivery is, is really hot right now. People are getting, or curbside pickup. So, so you you have to be able to read the room in a sense, read the trends, see what people are doing, and see how you can quickly pivot your business to to supply that. I was talking to somebody yesterday. Um, there's a company called Alignable, Alignable.com, and they've just launched a movement called uh, My Money Stays Local. And it's about it's about encouraging people to do business with local business owners. But don't go to, you know, not before you like hit send on Amazon. See, can I can I source that product locally? You know, can I find that locally? And one of the things he said is there was a restaurant owner who had read that there was this run on flour because everybody was baking at the beginning of the of the lockdowns. And nobody could get flour, but they could because they got them in vast commercial size um, packages. So she just took that and repackaged that commercial flour that she got into smaller packages and was selling it to consumers as, as if she were at store. And it was a great source of income for them. So think about what you can do to change, whether it's a a repackaged product or, or selling to a new market or selling a new way, how you can expand your customer and product base. Can I, can All I right. Yeah, 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 Betty, go ahead. 
I think I, I interviewed a, a lawyer in the U.S. on my radio show last week, and they said that COVID-19 lawsuits are just skyrocketing. And so businesses, unless the federal government is going to protect you, it, are really going to have a problem with COVID-19 lawsuits. So there's nothing you can really do to prevent someone from that. But what you can do is document everything you're doing to keep your employees safe and make sure that they do have a choice. So whatever you're doing as far as taking employees' temperatures or customers' temperatures or having people be aware of the risks and dangers, it's very important that we document every single thing we're doing to assist people in not getting COVID-19. So we have to take all the precautions possible. Document, document, document. Perfect. Uh, so let me take this, uh, let me ask this question from Laurie and then I'll take it to the other panelist. Uh, Laurie, um, what do you think are the new growth opportunities that exist for businesses in a post-pandemic world? We talked about uh, the masks right now, how textile industry can leverage it and all of that. But apart from that, what, what other opportunities do you see uh, coming for small businesses? Well, I think a lot of it really hinges on, you know, the kind of business we've been talking about, you know, local kind of retail businesses. And I think there's been a lot of good ideas there. Um, but, you know, aside from the retailers, we talked a little bit about manufacturers. How do you retool what you're doing? Because what people want to buy is changing, right? Um, and what, you know, the whole supply and demand thing, there's a huge demand for certain things right now and limited supply. So that equals opportunity for manufacturers. I think in terms of, you know, service kind of businesses, it, again, it's really going to differ. Obviously, the, the lawyers and accountants are going to have a different set of opportunities that they can maybe take advantage of because of this than uh, people that are, you know, hairstylists or, or massage therapists or something like that. You know, and it's, it's interesting because some of these personal service businesses, I think, are really challenged right now, right? Because the, um, you know, their obviously physical contact is a prerequisite. But we've, you know, already seen people, they, you know, they start packaging up the coloring they use for all their clients. I know when the nail salons opened here in Massachusetts, I looked for one where they have plexiglass up everywhere. And so I think, you know, some some people in some industries, you have a lot more flexibility. Others, let's face it, it is face to face. And so doing it more safely is probably the biggest opportunity you have. Um, the other thing I think is doing good. I think the good you can do uh, right now will provide you with a great, first of all, probably make you feel better. <laughs> Second of all, it will help people in your community and it will leave a lasting impression. I know a lot of restaurants have um, started doing things like pack packaging up food. Um, and meals for disadvantaged children and adults and things like that in their communities. And, and again, you know, it's, it's an investment and a gamble on the future, but I think if you can make it, um, you know, it's a good investment to make. Because people will remember that. They will value that. They'll be thinking of your restaurant first. Betty, would you like to add more to it? Yeah. I've just been really blown away by the creativity of entrepreneurs during this time. I mean, it, to me, it's just amazing what people are really coming up with. What's really popular now? I've seen drive-ins are coming back where you actually, for those people who don't remember drive-ins, you actually watch a movie in your car on a big screen. And there are pop-up drive-ins that are happening all over Chicago. Recreational vehicles are making a comeback because people can control their environment by renting a mobile home and traveling somewhere. What's also I've seen is restaurants are now are focusing on experiences where they're welcoming people into the restaurants, many, many fewer than they had before, and they're providing music or, rec or experiences around a certain cultural event. 
Uh, what I've also seen is individual travel is making a comeback where you have a single guy and a single family going out uh, on the road together and touring, and they're your only single guy. So don't be afraid to get creative during these times, and it's amazing what's making a comeback. I'm a huge cyclist, Lori. I'm so happy to see that cycling has made a huge comeback, and it's impossible to get a bicycle these days. Yeah. So to be creative and you'll see all these pop-up industries just really I mean one of the things that I've been so amazed by our partnerships are being performed in the United States I've seen Hertz get together with the security folks uh, for airline travel clear where you can rent a car from Hertz not by signing anything but just looking into a clear kiosk and they look at the biometric of your oh, eyes that's your fingers, great and you just go and you rent that way and it's all touchless like Laurie was talking about or contactless wonderful so uh, guys we have just 10 more minutes left for the session and i would love to take a few audience questions i see ivana has been uh, have been answering the questions already but i would love to take it to the other panelists as well uh, so Elise has asked, uh, and it has got one upvote as well. Uh, how can a 17-year-old like me start a business during this time? And what resources can I exploit if I have a passive income stream already working? So um, since Ivana has already answered it, I would like to take it to Riva. So um, if you're 17 and you have started a business, um, you, you probably have no legal paperwork because you're not allowed to have legal paperwork at 17. So if you're serious about starting a real business, you need to get a parent or an adult to help you um, make it legal. And by legal, I mean, get your business licenses, incorporate, I'm a big believer in, I don't care how small you are, every business should be some kind of corporation. An LLC is probably the one you would choose. Um, you cannot do that until you're 18 yourself. But you want to make sure you do that because you don't want to sell anything or do anything without that without that protection. So once you get that done, when you you get all your legal stuff done, this is a great time. Actually, there's so many throughout our history, so many businesses that have started in recessions that have started because it's it's the it's the rule of entrepreneurship. What do people need? And now needs are changing. And so there's a great time to, what, what Lori said, look at the opportunity. Where are the gaps in the market? And how can you fill that, that gap in? In terms of resources for any business owner, whether you're you know, 17 or 70, um, there's two places uh, that free, free advice from your local small business development center and SCORE. SCORE provides free mentorship. It's all online um, right now. They're not, they're not doing in-person meetings. So you can go and get a mentor anywhere in the country. It's, uh, you're not restricted to where you live. That is going to help you, do, an expert who can help you do what you need to do. So you can just go to SCORE.org and find a, a mentor and get some help and it, there's a lot of information on the score site as well there's a lot of, of resources there great uh so we have few more questions in the questions tab let me let me let me take a look okay so i'll uh, take it to barry uh barry someone is asking that i would love to see a whole bunch of little amazon pop-up what are the ways in which sales can be made as simple as ordering Amazon online? Well, I think what you should do is you should go and look at all the other marketplaces that are out there, like Alibaba and eBay and um, I think even Walmart. I mean, you guys chime in. And there's a zillion marketplace out there. Um, and, you know, just like, you know, Design Hill, right? So people can actually bid. You can actually find jobs or work right or you can sell things like etsy sign up for all of these kinds of things and you will find business that's the beautiful part about all the electronic marketplaces they're matching purchasers uh they're matching buyers and suppliers all over there and you will find someone in the world that wants to buy whatever you're selling it's amazing yeah and that goes for services too like all the sites like upwork and others that 
you know, if you're a creative person or a writer or an editor or a coder or whatever you are, uh, you know, you can put yourself out there and bid for jobs and opportunities. So I, I think just like in the, the Great Recession of 2008, which now seems like a walk in the park to a lot of us, yeah. um, we're going to have a lot of what I call accidental entrepreneurs, people that maybe never saw themselves starting their own business, but will find out that, hey, I can, I can get a... Um, get some footing here and get some traction. SMB Group, we started in the Great Recession. We both, that my co-founder and I were laid off uh, from another analyst firm and said, hey, nobody's hiring. We're going to start our own business. And we did it with our twist of focusing on SMB, which at the time there really weren't any analyst firms focused on SMB. So it's, it's kind of the best of times and the worst of times. And it's not easy. You know, we can't underestimate how difficult it is for people to shift gears. But, you know, think about what you're good at, what you love to do. And and um, I think as Barry said, there's probably a lot of marketplaces out there that you can start, you know, at least testing the waters with your, your services or products. I think a good idea is to join with your fellow small business owners in your community you know so a lot of let's say you're a, a small some small restaurants and a lot of small restaurants can't afford the delivery fees of working with the big restaurant delivery places so if you get together with companies in your community can you start your own delivery service you know you want to make sure everybody's bonded and insured but can you can you start one teaming up with with local business owners. Why is delivery just confined to food? It doesn't need to be. What if you are, um, you know, a retail store and you're, you know, especially if it's if it's local delivery and somebody goes on and, and buys a shirt and why can't they, you know, why can't you have that shirt delivered to them within 24 or 48 hours? So think about how you can respond locally. Think about how you can adapt big national or international um, practices and adapt them to your local community. And Rita, that, that actually, I mean, I totally agree. And that actually sparked something else that I think every single one of us on this webinar engages in. You have other people in your community, uh, like in our community, small business experts, influencers, advisors, et cetera, so partner with them and, you know, amplify them. They'll amplify you if there are joint kinds of projects um, that you can do together. You may bring a lot more value to the client. I think that that's another thing that's really important. You don't, even if you're solo, you don't always have to go it completely on your own. All right. I see this question which is asked by Jane, uh, and I think this this is something which is a pain point for every uh, small business out there. Uh, and I'll uh, take it to Ivana. Um, how how can businesses motivate their customers or clients to pay faster and become loyal? This is such an important question for today's session. Uh, Ivana, over to you. Well, I think I'm going to echo what I believe Lori and Reva said, right? Take a fresh look at what you're offering. You may need to tweak your offer a little bit. Maybe you need to uh, break your offer up into smaller pieces that are more affordable. It's always a great place to start. And here's a trick for doing that. You have the core offer where you make most of your money, like that thing you really want to sell. Now think about what is the first step? So let's say, for example, you're selling, I don't know, DIY candles or something. You've got all those things. What's something that they might want? Maybe it's a wick. So that might be something that you start with. Or maybe it's a, if you're in the information, maybe it's a book. Maybe it's something like that. So break your core offer up into little pieces and that's going to make it easier for customers to try you to become more loyal but i'm going to throw it over to one of the other panelists maybe like barry who yeah. might be able to talk more about like the accounting structure and some of these other things that small business owners can do well thank you so much first of all i want to emphasize 
that a customer is not a customer unless they pay you, right? If they don't pay you, then they're just they're just someone you got to chase to try to get the money. And I'd rather not do the work than not get paid. Remember, giving someone credit is a privilege, not a right. So I really think you have to think about how people are paying you. If you can get the money up front, do that. If you can get a deposit, do that, right? Um, offer a lot of value and people will pay you. And also in the end, make sure people have the resources to pay you before you do the work for them, especially if you're doing some kind of service-oriented business. So remember, in whatever business you're in, you're not a bank. Your business doesn't say Barry Moltz and Trust. We're not banks, right? People that don't pay are not customers. I'm a little passionate about this. <laughs> I think we can see that. <laughs> All right. I think that that brings us to the end of the session. I, the last question to the panelists, anything else that you would like to um, share and say to the audience? I, I do. I want to. This is a stressful time for all of us. And it can it's easy to get um, depressed or to sort of retreat into a cocoon or think I, I i'm gonna give up there's no way my business can survive but it can you just have to be a little bit more creative and a little bit more flexible and that's what small business owners are good at right we're supposed to be able to pivot on a dime so figure that out put your creativity back into gear and say how can what can i do what changes can i make incrementally or permanently like one of the big things is go home maybe you don't need office space so how can you become a permanent virtual company there are pivots you can make to save you money just try to figure them out this is, this is my fourth recession or whatever we're calling this now We've been here before. We're here 100 years ago, 1918. The world survived. Entrepreneurs survived. We are creative and we are resilient. Bunch. What I encourage you to do is reach out and ask for help. Connect with people. There's a lot of resources at Design Hill on this call. Reach out and ask for help. Now's the time to do it. You'll be better off because you did. And all I'm going to add is flip this crisis upside down. Things don't happen to you. They happen for you. If you start thinking about it, like, what if this happened for me? What would I do differently? So focus on that. No, I don't think I can talk about any of that. So I'll just agree with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. This brings us to the end of this wonderful discussion with our panelists, Barry, Ivana, Laurie, and Riva. This was indeed a value packed discussion where we touched upon a lot of topics and answered a lot of questions on restarting business operations in the new normal. Uh, although there is a lot uh, more that uh, we could have discussed, but unfortunately, we are limited by time here. I can see a lot of other questions there, uh, but um, you know, uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to take it now. I hope you guys loved this session. Once again, I would like to thank our panelists for taking out time to be a part of this discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Stay All safe, right, guys. Everybody. This is. All right, guys, this is not the end. We have a lot more events lined up for you in the coming days. The next event is on digital marketing, uh, best tips and trends and practices, which is on 22nd of July. So if you guys are interested and haven't registered yet, I am putting the link of our event section in the chat section uh, where you can find all our upcoming events. To stay updated with events like these, you can follow us on our LinkedIn page. Uh, you can also give suggestions on the topics you would like us to cover and speakers you want us to host. Uh, I'm dropping the link of our LinkedIn page in the chat section again. To watch this session uh, and other wonderful events, you can subscribe to uh, you know our event channel on uh, YouTube. And I will drop that link as well for other business owners who are listening to this and wish to source high quality designs and build their brand today. You can visit Design Hill. On that note, I would like to say bye to everyone who joined us here today. Take care and stay safe, guys. Bye. Take care, bye. everyone. Need to get your parents off your back? Head to the world's number one creative marketplace, Design Hill. When I started my photography business, I needed something that said this was more than just a hobby. 
It's not a hobby, Mom. That's why I went to Design Hill and got an amazing logo, super fast, at a price I could afford. The process was easy using Design Hill's logo maker. Just enter the name of your business, then pick out a number of designs that inspire you. I'll pick this one, and that, that one looks cute. Then pick your colors or let the system decide. Add some more info like a slogan, the industry your business is in, and your budget. The logo maker, using machine learning and artificial intelligence, will design thousands of logo variants that you can choose from and adapt. In fact, I was able to get everything from business cards to t-shirt design and complete social media kit, all with the click of a button. With that, I'm all set. Now everyone I meet knows I'm a legit photographer. Even my mom. It's real. Let the world know it's real and build your brand with Design Hill.